All right. Uh, great, great crowd, great audience. I want to thank Professor Ogletree and, and Harvard Law School uh, for allowing us to have this conversation. It's an important one, and I'm, I'm sure there will be many more um, as this issue is taking center stage um, across the country. Um, there's a lot of great giants and, and, and uh, leaders in the city of Boston and the state of Massachusetts, and I'm fortunate enough um, to have been raised and born to one of those great leaders and great giants. So without getting into too much of, of, of a resume, um, I'll tell you, she's the, uh, mm, yeah, there's a lot of history. She was from a teenage mother to a uh, practicing attorney to the first African-American female to become senator in the state of Massachusetts. Um, I'd like to welcome and bring up my mom, my hero, Diane Wilkerson. Okay, that was so unfair. That was, that was so, you're so very welcome. I love you all too. I'm gonna start by saying I give honor to God who is the head of my life and all of our lives and uh, to welcome all of you here. It is overwhelming, as Cornell said. It, it's, um, it's about time, though. Yes. It's about time. I'm going to be uh, uh, brief in my comments because we have a panel who's been here for quite some time, and they traveled long, and some have schedules, and so I want to get you to them. I want, in the context, to say first, um, I've been uh, to this campus on so many times for so many national, international and critical issues of the day. And I would, I'm trying to think if, I, if they've ever been convened by anyone other than Professor Ogletree. And I can't think of one that I came on invitation of someone else. But that will tell you a lot about who he is um, as a person. Um, and that as the Mr. Spence talked, or, um, Dr., or Reverend Skelton talked about this too, it could be anywhere else but and had, could have done other things in life. And I think about, um, I was thinking the other day, Charles, about the fact that, um, you know, we, we say tree, we say Charles. This is a person who has educated presidents. I mean, that's just, it's so cool to think about that, right? Um, he's an incredible mind. Um, I was sharing with Reverend Leah that I came to Boston in October of 1977 for a law day at Boston College Law School to speak to the recruiters from Howard Law School. Um, I grew up in Springfield, Mass, although I'm a daughter of the South, and came to Massachusetts um, running from the Ku Klux Klan from Pine Bluff, Arkansas. And I came to the campus on that day, I was a senior, and um, there was this young man who was then the president of the National Black Law Students Association who was the luncheon speaker. That was Charles Ogletree. I was so overwhelmed just by the whole day, the presence. I never got to speak to the recruiter from, from Howard. I applied at Boston College Law School, and um, came, the only law school I applied to, talk about you know, not knowing what you don't know. You're not supposed to do it that way. <laughs> um, but I didn't know any better. As someone said, I didn't know any, Dre talked about not knowing any black economists. I'd never been met. Uh, in Massachusetts, I'd never met a black woman attorney, and I only met one black male attorney, but watching Patricia Harris and Barbara Jordan on TV, I decided I wanted to do what they did. And that was really the rationale for me deciding I wanted to come to law school because I thought I would get to speak on the stage at the Democrat on Democratic National Convention like Barbara Jordan. <laughs> so don't laugh because in 2004, when Boston hosted the Democratic National Convention, I spoke on the floor and addressed the delegates for the Democrats on that national convention. So, I know, you can do anything is very real. Um, but I want to just, I want to lay the groundwork for what we're doing in the context of the importance of talking. I always, I used to say to my children, I can't imagine anything that people would do to you that would, you would be so angry that you would refuse to talk. So when people talk about wanting to fix things and solve things, but they don't want to sit in the same room, don't want to hear what they have to say, I know they're not serious because there has never been a conflict or issue resolved in this world, in this country, in your family, in your city, without talk. So we have to do that. And, it's going, and the other thing about that talk, again, directed to today, is that if it's about those um, third rail issues, 
politics, money, or race, that talk is going to be discomforting and uncomfortable. And if you're comfortable with it, you haven't had a real conversation. Because we can't have a nice conversation about that history if it's real. It's going to be uncomfortable. So you have to be prepared for that as well. So some of the panelists and some of the people who came to visit may not have even had a chance to talk at home, whether that's in New York or in Ferguson or in St. Louis, but they're going to be here today. So I want you to thank them for being willing to get on a plane to come here to have the conversation because we need to do that. The other thing that I would say about this, this week and the irony almost of the week is um, for me on Wednesday, and I don't know how many people made this connection to the birthday of Martin Luther King, all of the national um, uh, uh, conversation about his life and the importance of his life and what he stood for. And at the same time, the same day, we spent an entire day watching news reports damning protesters. How do you damn protesters on Martin Luther King's birthday? And you know why they damned the protesters? Because they made things inconvenient for people. I actually thought that was the whole purpose of protesting. So I'm not talking about you know, having someone stuck in an ambulance. What I'm saying is that the whole purpose of protesting is to get you to pay attention, to get your attention. And so chaining yourself on I-93 certainly got a whole lot of attention. The other thing that I thought was ironic about it, and I'm looking at Michael Curry, the president of the Boston NAACP, and I want to say thank you, and I was proud of him, because then there was a whole series of written articles about how Black Lives Matter has been hijacked by white people mm. and, le and, and Latino people and gay and lesbian people right. who are supporting the cause that have been solely born on the shoulders of black people. So now I'm totally confused. We complain because we've been in this feeling by ourselves for so long. And then we have this whole new group of people who come and say, I want to stand with you. And then you have people who said, this is none of their business. So, you know, I understand why young people are looking at us saying, guys, you guys sure screwed this up. <laughs> You know, because it doesn't make sense to them either. So for all those reasons, I look at this audience and I'm, I'm encouraged because none of you had to be here today. You could have been someplace else. But this is an issue that people have been trying to figure out how to talk about it and how to resolve it. And so I'm just going to ask you is if you do hear something that makes you uncomfortable and that you don't like the way it's said, Think in your mind how you could say it differently, because I think that's the biggest challenge for us. That if I'm so emotional about this, and I am, and I'm talking to you, and you don't hear me, I have to go back and think about how I say it differently, because I really want you to hear me. If I had another word that we could call racism or race, or we could call it bananas, I'd use bananas, because the word race is incredibly emotional for us in this society, mm -hmm. and it's different. And the only way we're going to get there is to go there. And so I want you all to go with us. So I'm going to start by calling up our first panelist, because I know that this is one that's got some ch scheduling challenges. And I think appropriate for it to be um, her leading this, because one of the, I think, real big questions for us in a black community is in this transition uh, and this evolution and in this week as we celebrate the birth uh, and the life of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King is that role of not only the clergy but the black church, which is our historical, uh, only uh, wholly owned institution that's gone through its own evolution. And there's a lot of opinion about that. But one of the things that Reverend Leah, and I hope you don't mind me referring to you as Reverend Leah, um, but this is, I want to make sure I tell you the whole, whole the Reverend Leah. Gunning Francis, but I'm going to call you Reverend Leah if you don't mind. Dr. Reverend, I hear you, Dr. Reverend Leah. I, no, uh, Dr. Reverend Leah, Dr. Reverend Leah, because she is um, representing that whole discussion at, at, from the Eden Sem Seminary about 
the role of clergy and her particular focus is um, you know, the eyes of this whole experience for black men and sons through the eyes of mothers. Uh, so important how she got connected to one of our own, Mona Lisa Smith, is through her work in uh, Mothers for Justice and Equality, and so important because I can't even tell you how many mothers that we have talked to, Reverend Leah, come, make your way up, who we finally had to come to grips with the fact that no mother has a child and says, I want them to grow up to be a killer, or I want them to be killed, or I want them to be in a gang, or I want them to be a victim, and that this whole conversation about what happens with black males can't be had only by black males when 75% of them are being raised by single moms. And our city is no different than any others. And I think that's the final point is, it's all connected. It's been said by several, it's all connected. You're gonna hear things that are stories or comments that she would make and you're gonna think about the Boston story that re you're reminded of when you hear it. So without further ado, uh, and as said, the lady who is, has been doing so much work in um, St. Louis and Ferguson, you might have seen or, or, or heard her name um, in the center of the, of the storm, both before Michael Brown, and now we'll be talking about life before Michael Brown and Mike, 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 life after, but I want to um, allow her to speak to us. Um, Reverend Leah, Dr. Reverend Leah, Dr. It's okay. Dr. It's right. Leah Gunning Francis. Did I get it right this time? All right, you wanna stand here? Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Leah Gunning Francis. I'm the Associate Dean for Contextual Education at Eden Theological Seminary in St. Louis. But most importantly, I am the mother of Evan and Desmond. And we live in the city of St. Louis with my husband, Rodney. To be very clear, justice has not come to Ferguson, Missouri. Darren Wilson deem, was deemed justified in mistaking Michael Brown for Hulk Hogan with demon eyes and believing he had no other recourse but to shoot and kill him. The St. Louis County Prosecutor Robert McCullough thought it best to put any random person who claimed to be a witness to this atrocity before the grand jury, even if it was easily proven that that person was nowhere around. Thousands of us begged, pleaded for a special prosecutor to be appointed to oversee this grand jury so that we might have a chance of justice, fairness, and equality being brought about, but it seemed to fall on deaf ears. This cry fell on the deaf ears of those who are charged to serve the people of Missouri and do what is just. Why is it that we only seem to be heard when something burns down? On this Martin Luther King Jr. weekend, many of us know that it was Martin Luther King Jr. who said that riots are the language of the unheard. And so as we come today to talk about solutions and think together about solutions, I know that no one in this room would dare make the claim that he or she has the solution, correct? But we have come to talk together, to listen, and to hopefully understand things a little more clearly. And so I come to lend my voice to that conversation as we begin talking about solutions, I suggest that we consider doing at least two things. Number one, dismantling white privilege. And number two, restoring the humanity of young black men. We have a political system that is a farce claims to represent the interests of all people, but yet it makes legal for unlimited amounts of campaign contributions. Well, maybe not here in, in Massachusetts, but did you know that in the state of Missouri, it is so. And so as we think about hearing those who are oppressed and those voices that are often muted, the state of Missouri continues to declare that only those who have enough money will be able to shell it out as they see fit to ensure that their voices are heard while those who don't continue 
to have to find other ways to be heard. We chastise black people for not voting while yet locking so many of us out through the faux war on drugs as Michelle Alexander and so many others have helped us to understand. So if we're gonna be serious, ladies and gentlemen, and I mean serious, about talking solutions to the issues that will be raised by colleagues and you all today, we have to dismantle white privilege. We have to say that it is not enough to continue with an economic, a political, a legal, a criminal justice system that continues to privilege and prioritize the voices of white people over and against those of black. Secondly, we have to restore the humanity of young black men. You know, I couldn't for the life of me understand how a jury would believe that a young man who had been shot four, five times would suddenly turn and charge at the person who shot him. Well, a person wouldn't do that, but Hulk Hogan would. We have to see our young black men as human beings first, because if we do not, we are continue to have them viewed as thugs, as ignorant, as lazy, as criminals. And so the George Zimmermans of the world and the like will continue to be justified in shooting and killing them. We restore their humanity by saying to these record companies that no, you will not continue to make billions of dollars producing and promoting songs that say, I'm a killer in, let's shoot it in, encouraging young black men that their lives don't matter and to continue to kill and shoot each other. We have to call upon black mothers. You know, I appreciate the efforts and intent of this film, but it's pretty offensive to sit and watch a table, a round table of people coming up with solutions and not see one black woman sitting at that table. I am a mother too. I know the face of motherhood in this country. Good motherhood is white, but I'm just as good as anybody else and deserve to be at the table talking solutions, talking answers to the children that came out of my body. So let us, ladies and gentlemen, I beg you, we've got to dismantle white privilege and we've got to restore the humanity of all people, thank you. I think that uh, Reverend Leah made the very point that, um, that I did. You know, we're gonna do some, some things or you'll see some things done and it may not be done in the way you think and we may not even get it right. We have to just kind of go back at it. I, as, I, as I ended with my comments, I can't see a real conversation about this whole issue without the active participation of, of, of mamas. <laughs> of mamas. Um, and as also the mother of a single mom raising um, two black males, you know, one of the things I explain to people is that um, both of my sons are in their 40s. And, yeah, don't I look good to have sons in their 40s? I know, I know, I know. Um, I know what you're thinking. But my personal triumph and victory is that I've kept them alive. Mm. Things that other people never think about. You know, that they have been gr grown up in an urban environment called Boston with such similar realities as what you are gonna hear and they're alive. And they're not on drugs and they're not in jail. Now the irony is their mama went to jail, but they didn't go to jail. <laughs> and so that's just personal triumph and privilege for me. Um, I, I thought that this article really said so much and said it all about the introduction. So I'm gonna read the caption to you. Um, it says, confronted by a knife wielding man, the Boston Police Department again make an arrest without gunfire. We are now celebrating by in press caption that the police don't shoot people who come to a gunfight with a knife. And the story, this is from this week,
The story is about this being the second week in a row that the police were confronted with someone who was wielding a knife and they didn't shoot them. So I got it. I got it. And so this is the context in which we speak. The gentleman next to me, um, Gabriel Baez, is the nephew of Eric Garner. And I know that you pronounce the last name. Just how do you, how does the family pronounce the last name? Baez. Not yours, Eric. Oh, Eric Garner. Garner. I did. Say, I just want to make sure I pronounce it right. Um, but this is Eric Garner's. You saw the story. And for those of you who used to think that if we could just get it on video, then we'll get justice. Rodney King dispelled that about 25 years ago. Um, Calvin Bacot, community leader and founder, does a lot of work in New York, and we'll talk about the Bacot Foundation. Erica Ford, the New York Foundation called Life Camp. Um, Mona Lisa Smith, who of course I know, our, uh, that's our Mona Lisa. Mothers for Justice and Equality, as I said, met, um, Dr. Reverend, met Dr. Leah Gunning Francis through that commonality and some questions about what the, the organizations are doing in Boston around this issue, because unfortunately, we've been at it for a while. And so I'm going to start with um, Calvin. I want you to actually. I'm going to start with you. Um, we only have till 3:30. I'm told. So if, I think if you can each do five minutes, and I'm not sure what's going to happen. I know it's long because it's long day, but um, we only have till 3:30. So unless I get a signal that we can sp spend a little t longer time, that's nope. I got that signal. Says no. So Calvin Bacot, um, you're on. Um, first and foremost, I want to say um, thank God for Jesus for allowing me to be here um, today. Um, I'm humbled at the same time because this is a walk that I never thought I would actually be walking to get to the point to be here in my life. Um, many years ago, um, I've chosen to live the life of crime, and um, that set me back so many years that it didn't allow me to be in the presence of people such as yourself. Um, I served almost 20 years in and out of prison, state and federal. And um, that taught me a lot of things to realize that there's more to life than to allow myself to be caught up into a life which is not as important as, as it should be. Um, I've caused a lot of grief to my parents. And uh, I'm a child that was born with both parents in the same household. So I don't have any excuse by saying um, I, I come from a single parenthood. Um, my grandmother raised me, things of that nature. You know, um, I played the piano, I played the keyboard, I did all those things. And it's, another, it's not my parents' fault that I chose the route that I went. It's just me looking at other peers and I choose to look at those things to allow me to be able to do the things that I've done. Um, now I'm here. Uh, fortunately enough, um, after going in and out of prison, I pled guilty to 25 years in 1991 and I gave 10 years back in 1992. I've done almost 14 years and, um, and came home in 2004. Uh, overall, I've done almost 20 years, like I said. And um, I came home in 2012, and I choose to say that I want to change my life. And my dad told me many years ago that we want you to change, but you won't change until you're ready, and I understand that. And I choose to change because I have four children, and, um, and they're all girls. Uh, I don't want a young man to walk in my household and tell me that um, he's who I used to be. And I also don't want to be remembered for who I used to be. I want to be remembered for who I am now. And um, that being said, I just don't want um, the gap between the police officers and the knowledge that I have to um, go unheard. They need to know, they need to understand that I understand you, but the younger brothers don't understand you. And I'm the voice of the younger brothers in New York. And um, I'm bridging that gap between dealing with other leaders in other different states and throughout. Um, I've come to have a fortunate life when I came home in 2004, and I actually wound up managing um, the artist Akon. Um, those are blessings that uh, that's been bestowed upon me. And those are blessings that I understand to get me to the point to where I am right now. And um, what we don't have is just open communication, an open line of communication with the, um, with the, with the officers. Um, more so, I can only speak really for New York. Um, the Eric Garner situation, 
you know, that, that in itself is a thing, whereas I can actually replace Eric Gardner and put myself in the same situation. And it's just unfortunate that Eric Garner is not here to tell you who he is and what he is and what he stood for. But this is just a man that only asks for various things. He just asks to breathe. That's all he asked for. He wasn't saying that he didn't want to not get arrested. He didn't want to say that he didn't want to go through the system, anything of that nature. Let the Lord do what it do. But at the, end, at the same time, don't let the Lord be the cause of me dying. You know, and um, that being said, I know that you know there's other people on the panel that um, that plans on speaking, but again, you know, I don't want to take up too much time. I'm humbled to be able to walk in the same steps as Malcolm did, and um, you know, I just want to thank y'all for allowing me to be able to speak and have this opportunity to do so. Um, I thank you, yeah, and I'm hoping you. we may have a few minutes so we can talk about specifically more of what you started than what next. I'm going to go to Gabriel okay. Bias next, as I indicated. The, uh, Gabriel is, is the nephew of Eric Garner and has been, as many people in his family, kind of dispatched to represent him and speak for him um, so that the world will know who he was because he's not here to tell us himself. How you doing, everybody? My name is Gabriel Baez, as she said. I'm from New York, Harlem. Um, I kind of grew up like the same story as the kids in St. Louis, you know, nothing different. Um, father abusing drugs, mother running around, you know, same story. I just want to say that um, the problem with police brutality is real. It's going on in every major city, small, small towns, whatever you may have it. I just think that um, we have to change the relationship between the police and the urban community by um, doing what Andre is doing, you know, bringing everybody together, putting everybody in the same space, letting them have conversations together, getting to know each other. Um, and also, with, with the children, for us to have a better tomorrow, we kind of got to pay more attention to the children. You know what I'm saying? Because these kids, like, you know, police are trained to deal with violence. And um, just like soldiers, when they go away to war, they train for violence. And when they get confronted with violence and death and situations like that, they come home and they get treated. You know, they, they, it's, it's called... Um, post-traumatic stress syndrome. You know what I'm saying? So imagine a little, a, a, a young child, not even a teenager, 11 years old, 14 years old, um, seeing shootings, seeing stabbings, maybe himself being a victim of a stabbing or a shooting, and when he gets confronted by the police, him and his family, it's not approached with respect. It's not, they're not dealt with with respect, you know? Police will walk up to you, um, what were you doing in that neighborhood? I live here. Were you selling drugs? No, I was coming home from school. Do you know who shot you? Who was he acquainted with? What are you doing hanging around these people, such and such? Meanwhile, you're an 11 year old kid. You don't know what's going on. You're not supposed to be approached like that. You should, this should be like more caring, more understanding. And it's not there. I say that that is, is what needs to change with policing in the urban community. You know what I'm saying? I mean, with that, I'm, I'm here. I'm here because my uncle did pass, and the way he did, and, and, and what happened, it was a national worldly news. But I'm here more for the future so that it doesn't happen to other families and other children. You know what I mean? Thank you for having me, people. Mona Lisa, um, Mona Lisa Smith. For Mothers for Justice and Equality, and I'm going to let uh, Mona Lisa tell you a little bit about what they do, and you'll understand immediately why this is so connected to uh, the overall context of the discussion today. Mona Lisa. Thank you. I'm Diane. Um, as, um, as you heard, my name is Mona Lisa Smith, and I am the um, president and CEO at Mothers for Justice and Equality. And, um, and we're a grassroots organization that was founded by mothers, mothers who had lost children to violence, mothers who were raising um, brown and black boys in urban communities, um, mothers who were working in social service agencies and leading um, those agencies and were tired of um, going to too many funerals. 
um, we had we felt a sense of hopelessness and um, but we knew that our hopelessness had to be turned into more than just hopelessness that we needed to create change and we need to get at those tables and begin to talk about the solutions that we knew were in our hearts so we founded mothers for justice and equality on a mission to come up with solutions our vision was very simple but very complex a vision where it's not normal or acceptable for children to be murdered or incarcerated we were giving birth to children and our children were dying those that were not dying were being incarcerated. Our children were being expected to, um, to achieve and to learn in schools that did not even acknowledge the fact that they were being traumatized every day and that they were not achieving scores. So we came up with solutions. We worked with the governor um, and when he was running and, and, and violence was not a priority and we convinced him that violence needed to be a priority. We um, work with the um, House of Correction and we, we, we go in and we teach um, financial literacy and education to in inmates. And many would wonder why would victims, why would you as a victim who have lost a child to violence, why would you want to work with the perpetrator? Because our goal is to end violence. How would we end violence if we do not go to the root of the problem? And that is recidivism. That's when, 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 when our young men and women are taken into prison and then, then they're not given proper um, treatment and education and then they're released back into our communities. We know that as mothers because those are our children that are behind those bars. So if we don't speak for them, who would? We had to show that our children mattered to us, not just to society, but we needed to show our children that their lives mattered to us and that we were gonna fight for their rights. We were gonna fight for them to live. They needed to see us to take a stand and that hope could be restored through our walk. And, and that's not um, unusual because that happens all around the country. That happens all around the world. But when you're faced with losing your child to violence and then you're, you're not acknowledged even as the fact that you lost a child to violence, insensitive comments are being made that your child was part of a gang. You know, codes were being given, words that that life didn't matter because it was gang related, but in the same breath, you couldn't tell us who murdered our children, but you knew that they were in a gang, mm -hmm. but you didn't know who murdered them. So, you know, these type of things just didn't make sense to us. But we were just ordinary citizens, and we were women that were walking around in pain. You know, we were, we were hurting and we could not take any more. So justice will come when you come to a place where you just can't take it no more. When your courage will come from a place where you have no other choice but to be courageous. And that's, where, that's how Mothers for Justice and Equality was birthed. And we, we found that you know, our children were, were being able to go into a store and purchase a knife just as anybody would purchase penny candy. And, and this was from a mother who had lost her son to a stabbing. And, and we worked with city council and got a knife ordinance passed that, that banned that that would happen to our children. Were children purchasing knives because they wanted to commit violent acts? No, they were purchasing a knife because they wanted to be protected. They wanted to protect themselves. They were being bullied and they were being you know, um, robbed on their way to school. So because they couldn't get protection from the police, because every time they walked down the street, they were shaked down because they looked like a criminal to them. So they had to protect themselves. And we as mothers had to protect them and stop store owners from profiting off of their fears. So we worked very diligently and we got that ordinance passed. We work with the schools and we work with others because trauma is, is a problem for us in our community and it's starving our children of their right to, to, to be productive. So we have to go in and we have to begin to explain how trauma is, is impacting their ability to be educated. And Thank these you. are things that we do and we're just, we're just mothers. We're ordinary citizens and we are at those tables um, talking about things that really matter to us. 
And, um, and our work has um, grown. Um, and people are finding us all around the country. Leah has found us, Dr. Leah. You know, mothers from Atlanta, mothers from Chicago. You know, and, um, and, and Main Street America is recognizing that we do have a voice. We were given by the Boston Business Journal an Extraordinary Leadership Award. The Boston Globe recognized as innovators. The Boston Magazine said we're idealists. But in reality, we are mothers. We are mothers that are standing for justice and equality for our children. And we are a force. And why? Because we don't have a special agenda. This is coming from our womb because we lost our children to senseless street violence and others are being incarcerated for no reason at all. But just because they are falling victim to poverty, they're falling victim to lack of resources. So if we're gonna change you know, how things are being done, then, then that change just can't happen with a handout, with people giving us um, um, money. That change has to happen when there is a true shift in power. When, when, when power is relinquished to those that are afflicted by the violence, that's when that change will happen. Thank you, thank you. And I'm gonna apologize for Dr. Leah because she told us early she's got to. I'm sorry. That's okay, we understand, we thank, thank, thank you. you. We I'm, thank you. One line, can I just have one line, quick? Yeah. One line. Until the killing of black men, black mothers' sons, becomes as important to the rest of this country as the killing of white mothers' sons. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. Amen. Thank you. And Erica Ford. Erica is also from New York. The foundation, as I said, the Life, Life Camp. I want to talk quickly about some of the things that you're doing and as the other panel, I think, is getting ready to come. Ms. Ford. So in two seconds, I'll say what I know. But um, I'm from New York, and, and I used to be the young person who the police would carry their picture of and say, when you come on the scene, get her because she's gonna start the riot or she's gonna rile the people up and make sure you get in. They used to call me skunk because I have the black and white hair. And I, I, I literally went from fighting physically the police and being arrested every time I was encountered with the police to sitting on Ray Kelly's advisory committee and working with the police in the community to find a way that we can work together because as leaders, if we don't work with our enemies or the people who we deem oppress us, then we will not get a resolution. Um, so I went from, from that to instituting in New York City something called the New York City Crisis Management System, which addresses the question of violence on a systematic way. So it takes the question of violence as a disease, whether it's violence coming from the police, violence coming from black on black crime, violence coming from miseducation. It is a disease that is con that is spreads into an epidemic in our community, and all of us get infected by it. And the same way we treat diseases in the world, we treat the disease of violence. We have to address it in that manner. And, and stop our people from being infected. So, I mean, there's so much to say. I would say my, my website is lifecampinc.com, lifecampinc.com. You can text peace is a lifestyle to 69866. Peace, or I'll even make it simple. Today, this is Peace Week. I started something in New York called Peace Week because I said if we can have a week of peace, we can have a month of peace, we can have a year of peace. So right now, as we sit here, we're celebrating Peace Week in New York, and tomorrow we have some of the mothers from Sandy Hook, some of the mothers from very, the Eric Garner family and all of the different families coming together with Russell Simmons and other people to look at the question of forgiveness. So we have mothers and, and families from both sides of the gun. So we have a mother whose her son killed another person's son, and they're coming together to forgive each other on this day. And, and we do that in a sense, and there's so much to say in one second, so forgive me, but this tr question has to be addressed in a multifaceted way. It cannot be addressed in emotion. It cannot be addressed in looking only at what cannot happen or what should not happen, but what can we do as concerned people to bring compassion into the heart of people who look at us every day and want us dead. And we apologize to the audience because I, I know that we had hoped to have 
much more of an opportunity and dialogue and you know the reality is what it is. I think the ending is really how we began and that is the importance of the continued dialogue. I would say particularly important that there be white people engaged in this conversation. Right. And I wanna say that. I think particularly irrelevant, it's relevant because of the national and local discourse of this week that suggested that the Black Lives Matter was black, life, black people's issue and that white people or Latino people or lesbian, gay, LGBT community shouldn't be involved. Unless we're all in it, none of us are well. And that's just the, that's really the bottom line, that we have to accept this as our collective issue to resolve on every level. And to, for me, it's not, I know Mr. Spence, I think is still here, talked about politicians. They're not the only ones. If that was the case, we would be having a panel. It's about the orientation that we receive as Americans, that something happens to all of us and we take uh, our roles and absorb um, emotion and position so that we become so numb that craziness doesn't even seem right. crazy to you anymore. That we take it we as perfect. standard that when we see a story in a suburban community about a young person dying and at the end of the story the newscaster always says counseling will be available at the high school for those who need it. Have you ever heard that said at the end of a story about a black child or, or a male, or male or female in our community? So there's an assumption there that you spoke to, I think Mona Lisa talked about it, but we, we accept it. We don't even think about it, we just keep moving. School gets canceled. It's all day for parents and the teachers and the, you know, the, the, the uh, children to go in and talk about what happened to their friend. But there's an assumption that we don't need that. And the people that come in to do it are not culturally com compassed to us, so they can't help us anyway. And that's why it's important for students who are coming into these fields to go back to the community and provide the services for the community because y'all are here at Harvard learning and studying, and we need you on the front line to provide those services to our people. We need you. We need you. Dre, you're taking it from here? Can I tell the story while you're coming in? No. Yes, you I love you. I love you. I, I know, I love, I love you, you too. This is what you, something that you said, because we're in Cambridge. David Harris spoke to this, that in 1994, when Jermaine Goffigan was shot and killed at his birthday party on Halloween, he became the youngest homicide victim, it was a lot of outrage. Two years later, Jeffrey Curley from Cambridge, a young six-year-old, seven-year-old boy was kidnapped and he was murdered and they found him on the side of the river. His father and Lieutenant Governor came to the State House and demanded the reinstatement of the death penalty. I had the opportunity to debate the death penalty seven times in the 17 years I served in the Senate. But on that day, what I asked my colleagues is, if you can tell me why you feel the killer of Jeffrey Curley should be executed, and you didn't feel that way about Jermaine Goffigan, then, then I will be okay with you voting in favor of the death penalty. And the senator next to me, I will never forget, said, I'm changing my vote. And my point is just this, something about how we are raised in this country has oriented us to the fact that we think black people's lives matter less. Yes. So when they're taken, you don't have to pay as much as you do if you take a white one. He couldn't answer, and it was just directly. I had Jermaine Goffigan's grand grandmother up in the in the um, in, in the state house. He couldn't answer, and he had voted yes every time and said, "I'm going to vote no." So think about that, because that's really what this is about every day. That's, right. that's how it happens. It's not about the police become racist. It's how we have people who think about race who become police. So in that context, we're turning it over to Dre, and I thank you oh, for giving oh. me that time. <laughs> <laughs> Um, having conferred with Professor Ogletree in light of the fact that you are here and engaged in this is a wonderful thing, um, we're going to open the floor up for questions. But I want to say this before we go forward. We need questions. <laughs> questions. If it takes you 10 minutes to get to your question, I'm going to have, we only have 10 minutes we're going over to get questions. So if you have a quick question, not life history, not personal bio, you know what I'm saying? Because he was mean, yes. 14 years in the penitentiary, I am mean. But I want questions. So if you have some questions for the panelists and the panelists, if you can be brief and everybody can't answer the same question. Right. Yes. Question. Uh, you have a at Harvard, but I believe this
Okay. We, we don't have, the question was, how do we con condense the Ivy League into taking on this issue? We're not the Ivy League. These are people who are in the street doing good work. They have no authority over what the Ivy League does or doesn't do. So I appreciate the question, but it's the wrong panel for that particular question. But we're available to go wherever you would like to take us. <laughs> Don't get it twisted. We are available if we work with you to make that happen. Let's make it happen, brother. Let's make okay. it happen. I love you. <laughs> so we agree with you. Let's we, make we it agree. happen. No, no. We a, lot, a lot of times that would be based on social media as well. So just to take advantage of that. You know, the, exactly. The, the, um, the world is built on us being able to relate with each other from one room to around the world. So again, the Twitter, Facebook, et cetera, and everything else along the way. Next you know, question. that's our voice right there. Next question, uh, sir. Yeah, is uh, President Obama's uh, program for body cameras for uh, police officers a significant one? Mona Lisa. Um, I, I personally think it's, it's very important um, that we have, um, you know, that body cameras on police officers. And I, I wouldn't understand why any law enforcement officer would object to that. Gabriel? Yeah, there was an incident not too long ago when um, a police had on the body camera and he turned it off and turned it back on before he did what he did, you know? And it's also with the, with, the, with the cell phone cameras, there's another incident when a female was recording an officer um, doing a random stop and he took her phone, dragged her out the car, arrested her, took the phone to the precinct, erased the footage and released her, but her son so happened to dig into the iCloud account and got the footage and released it. So it's out there and it's available. So I mean, there's always ways of getting out of stuff. There's glitches in the system, and people do find them whenever they need to. You have a question, sir? Mr. Wilkinson, are you going to We're, we, you know what? I would say no. We're on another mission, much more, much consistent with what Charles said. It's about the economics. The best social program is a job. We are completely and totally focused on economic development and wealth building. You'll hear more about that over the coming months. We have a question over here. Erica? I think that the public opinion in the world is just the same. The same thing is happening here, it's happening throughout the world because we are looked at as black people, as African people, the same all over the world. So the justice that we talk about and the, and the compassion and the lack of discrimination and um, um, ending the question of, of white privilege is a question that exists throughout the world. One last question. Front row. Is there another way to frame the term white privilege? Senator. L we'll go. Is there okay. another thing that yeah, makes it longer? Longer? I can say shorter. Evening the playing field. Evening the playing field. Okay. You know, we're not, we're not on an even playing field. So we start off, you know, way back at the end of the thing, and then we're supposed to be at equal grounds, and we're supposed to be looked at as equal, and we're not in no form or fashion. Yeah, yeah, that's your I, I think the, the answer to that would be that um, it's that blunt so that nobody misunderstands what you're talking that's about. Right. And so, sure, you could call it something else. Like I said, I joke about it, but you can call it something else, but I'm not sure that the point would be made. The good thing is you've seen a, any number of articles recently where white people are writing about what they acknowledge. One of the exactly. things the protesters this week said is that we know that we could go on 93 and stop the traffic for four hours and they were right. Every single one of them were released on their own recognizance. Mm -hmm. I would want I'm to. Gonna, that's all I'm going to say about that. Try it. In, in, <laughs> in the interest of time, and we have another panel to hold, um, I want to thank the panelists and.